um, how you connected with that that Tartan Toku. Yes. Tartan Toku, when I was at university, um, I, my thesis was where the solutions to problems come from. My advisor, Dr. Green, says you need to practice a, an esoteric tradition recommending Buddhism. Einstein did this. So I found out that Tartan Toku came to Berkeley about two months before I asked this question. He lived in the avenues on Webster Avenue in downtown Berkeley. So I went there to go meet them. <clears throat> now, when I went to the address I was told to go to, there was a Tibetan person. I said, is Tartang Toku here? He says, Tartang Toku is not here. He lives across the street. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I walk across the street, and Tartang Toku is coming down the, the driveway. And as soon as I see him, I start to cry. I'm crying and crying, tears everywhere. We sit down in the gutter on the street. And I cry, and I cry for like five minutes. And we don't say anything. And then all of a sudden, Tarthang goes and Joel Shefflin, who was his sponsor, he says, Joel, he can come to ceremony. <laughs> that was when I first- In English. English. Yeah, he said this in English. Mm -hmm. He says, Joel, Joel, he can, he can come to ceremony. I guess you have to be invited or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I went to the ceremony at that, at that, that time. A year and a half later, I actually moved into uh, Pameling Monastery in mm -hmm. Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Now, I went there because my wife dropped me off on the freeway with $150 and she said, don't call, you know, mm -hmm. come back later, really later. And so I went to Tarthang and I said, is there a place to stay? And he says, oh no, all the rooms are filled up. There's no place here. But if you can find a place, maybe it's okay. So I wandered around and in the basement, which was full of basement stuff, there was a closet about the size of this table, underneath the stairs into the temple room. Mm -hmm. And I said, Lama, I found a place down in the basement. He says, okay. So I move in the basement down under the stairs into the temple room. I feel like a Harry Potter novel. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> anyway, I lived there for two and a half years. In the closet. In the closet underneath the temple room. Mm -hmm. but. When I got this visualization that I took the map from, mm -hmm. the protocol was that you had to do formal practices and the visualization was given to you um, by the Lama. It was a very important thing. Well, what happened is I went into the altar and I stole one because I wanted to know what it was all about. And it's a very complicated thing. And I actually have a picture of the original one. Mm -hmm. Well, <clears throat> I put it on my altar in my mm -hmm. closet in the basement. Now, Tarthang was really concerned about all the students, you know, cohabitating with one another because they're all pretty much adults and they didn't want, you know, the, the nuns or the monks and the nuns, you know, fooling around with one another. So wake up call was at six o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but, and so he came in to my, he found my room and now he was on the fourth story. To get to my room, you had to come down all the stairs through the kitchen, mm -hmm. down the back stairs, down a hallway, through the dark basement. Getting to my room was not easy. Mm -hmm. At quarter to six, mm -hmm. my door bangs open, and here's Tarfang Toku, who's, he's a big man. I mean, he filled up my closet door. Well, what he found, me, I was sitting there, you know, doing my meditation and chanting and doing my mantra. My altar was set up, and here was this visualization thing mm -hmm. right in the middle of everything. <laughs> <clears throat> and this was 15 minutes before you were even supposed to get up. Uh -huh. And I was chanting like a mad mendicant, you know, doing my practices and being very, you know, formal. And I was sitting in the lotus and the candles were there and the lighting, you know, the incense and every, all the bowls. I mean, it was just, just perfect. And he goes in there and he looks and he goes, <clears throat> <clears throat> and then, which means that he couldn't find anything to complain about. <laughs> but I get this, <clears throat> <clears throat> and he slams the door and <laughs> he never came down. Two and a half years later, he never came down again. But Tarthank Q was he was he was really hard on folks, but he was really nice to me. Mm -hmm. And one at one time he actually gave me five dollars for doing some amazing piece of work. And all the students were going, He gave you money? <laughs> Tarthank doesn't give his wife money. <laughs> But he was, uh, he, he was really good to me. Mm -hmm. And he was horrible to everyone else. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea why. 
But there's lots of lots of stories. In fact, I met <clears throat> some uh, uh, Galtha Rinpoche people up in Northern California in Ashland, and their history starts about 1976, mm -hmm. which is, but I had been the Chopin to these llamas from about 71 to 76, so mm -hmm. I know all the early stories. Mm -hmm. It turns out I'm the only one that does know all the early stories because I live with these people. Mm -hmm. So they asked me to write a kind of a, a commentary. It's not a it's maybe a biography. Mm -hmm. I don't, it's not necessarily an autobiography. Mm -hmm. And I'm calling it Llama Tales. Mm -hmm. And of course, Tarthang Toku is you know, part of that Llama Tales. And I'm probably going to write it. And I've started it, but I think it's a good name. And tell the, the finish was a story with uh, Tarthang was in, mm -hmm. uh, in, in that when he signed up the Sonoma. <clears throat> OK. Um, partly, it's, it's uh, when you do a mala, you know, for your practice, it's 108 beads, and, you, and it, it's a way of counting your, your meditational practices, mm -hmm. which go up to 100,000. 100, mm -hmm. Well, I spent a lot of time getting this mala together, and I, I was at Sonoma State, and I got some what's called scintillation plastic. This was used in, in uh, Bevatrons to f check uh, atomic particles. Mm -hmm. But when in the dark or in the room, it was white. When you went outside, it turned purple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He really liked that for some reason. Anyway, I fixed this whole thing up, <clears throat> and I gave it to him to, to bless. And so you give it to the Lama and says, would you bless the Mala? He took the Mala and he put it in his pocket. I go, oh, man. <laughs> what do I do? So I asked Joel Shefflin. I go, he gave the Lama my Mala to bless and just put it in his pocket. And Joel says, oh, that's very good. Very good luck. Very, very good merit. Very good luck. You're very fortunate that he does this. You're, you're very fortunate. I go, he took my mala. And he, go, and he said, don't worry, it's OK. And I go, you know. So I go, well, I have to go make another mala. Mm -hmm. He had that for like two months. And then he was buying this, the temple up at Sonoma, mm -hmm. up in Sonoma. And he was going to sign the newspapers. Mm -hmm. And I saw him using my mala on the way out and uh, said the people that took him there, he said he, he, he did use that mala for the whole negotiation before mm -hmm. he signed it. And then like two or three days later, he gave it back. To, do it to you? Him? Yeah. And he says, oh, I think these are yours, you know, something like this. And he puts a mala in my hand and I went like this, oh, I mean, I, mean, I, I dropped like a foot. It was, it, it was like the mala weighed like, like 100 pounds. And I go, oh, oh yeah, I guess. We collected some stuff along the way. <laughs> anyway, I had that mala for a bunch of a bunch of years. It was a like a crystal glass crystal bead mala and with a simulation mm -hmm. plastic on. Anyway, it's a pretty good story, and uh, one of the 